Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, please send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, be sure to cast your vote for the show on uh, Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we get started with today's episode of The Adventures of the Abbots, I do want to encourage you to check out my wife and I's book, Tales of the Damn Night. It's a great superhero comedy with a solid family story. We pay homage to a lot of the great classic superheroes, and I think you'll enjoy it. You can check it out at dimnight.com, get information on where it can be purchased, as well as uh, be able to read excerpts, reviews, interviews, and all the rest. It's at dimnight, D-I-M-K-N-I-G-H-T dot com. Well, now it's time for today's adventure with Pat and Jean Abbott, The Clue of the Ivory Thread. After all, a quarter of a million dollar robbery and a few murders might not bother you. But when your favorite perfume doesn't put your husband in a romantic mood, wouldn't you be furious? The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as Pat and Gene Abbott, those popular characters of detective fiction. NBC invites you to join Pat and Gene each week at this time for another recorded adventure in romance and crime. Tonight's story, The Clue of the Ivory Thread. And here is Gene Abbott to set the stage for tonight's puzzle in murder. We were in Pat's office in San Francisco. I'd just spent a fabulous amount of money on a bottle of perfume. And, well, like any smart wife, I was going to break it to my husband gently. Pat? Mm Mm-hmm? You like my perfume? Yes, all right. Well, now, isn't that a romantic answer? The ad said, This delicate fragrance will make your loved one float on an enchanted cloud. (laughs) Oh, I'm going to ask for my money back. I'm going right to the store and say, my husband did not float. How much was this gookum? Gookum? Pat Abbott, this just happens to be Prince Michael's essence of gardenia. The most famous, rare, exotic perfume in the world. Mm -hmm. How much was this gookum? Forty dollars a half ounce. Holy Aunt Hannah. Don't scold me, Pat. Come here, darling. Close to me. Smell it now. Well, doesn't it have an effect on you? Well, now that you mention it, Mrs. Abbott. Oh, curses spoiled again. <laughs> Come in. Mr. Abbott? Yes? Uh, might I see you alone for a moment? Ah, uh, sure. Would you wait in the other room, Jean? Oh, that isn't necessary, Pat. How do you do? I'm Mrs. Abbott, and I often work with my husband on his cases, so you can go uh, right would ahead. Would you wait in the other room, Jean? Well, he doesn't have any secrets from me, and so... Oh, all right, Pat. Don't glare. Uh, Sit down, Mr. Uh, Uh, Call me John Smith. Well, now, that isn't a very impressive beginning, is it? If a client hasn't enough confidence in me to tell me his real name... I have confidence in you. I'm checked up on you. They tell me you're one of the best private detectives in America. I need someone like that. Someone very resourceful. What's on your mind? Take this envelope. Open it. No, oh, no, no. Don't bother counting. Ten thousand. There's ten thousand in cash in it. It's yours. If I do what? You must help me uh, see someone. Who do you want to see? A woman named Eloisa Fernandez. Eloisa Fernandez? It may be a little difficult for you to arrange for me to see Miss Fernandez. Why? She's dead. You kill her? No. Where's the body? Buried in a cemetery about 45 miles from here. Oh, sorry, I don't go for body snatching. Do you go for $10,000? Here, take it back. I also don't like cases where I don't know my client's real name. 
Why do you want this woman's body? Part of our agreement would be that you're not to ask any questions. Well, I don't go for that either. This deal won't wash, pal. It would take a long, long time for you to earn $10,000 as a private detective, Mr. Abbott. You'd have to find a great many lost puppies and husbands with convenient amnesia to earn that much. This wouldn't take more than one night. I, I need the help, Mr. Abbott. I'm rather clumsy, and you're self-assured. You wouldn't become panicky. Uh-huh. When I came in, Mr. Abbott, I smelled your wife's perfume in the room. It's superb. She has very expensive taste. Now, I'm offering you $10,000 cash, Mr. Abbott, free of taxes, of course. I'd never report it. And I'd advise you not to. Get out, John Smith or John Doyle, I have whatever. a very fast car, Mr. Abbott. We could be at the cemetery in less than an hour. I said get out. You complimented me. You mentioned some of my attributes, but you forgot to mention one. I'm pretty good at throwing people downstairs. But, Mr. Abbott... Good afternoon, Mr. Smith. It would certainly be childish... Get out of here! My son, I'm proud of you. Oh, shut up. Taint easy to turn down ten big ones. Were you at that keyhole again? Pat, what do you suppose he wants with that body? I think... Yes? It's his wife's body. Go on. He murdered her. Yes? Because she bought some fancy perfume for $40 a half ounce. That's not funny. Well, that's our friend the ghoul again. Now, come in. Uh, Mr. Abbott? Yes? Uh, I'm Dr. Frederick Hayes of the Psychiatric Institute. Oh, sit down, Doctor. Uh, Jean? I'm going. Uh, doctor, what can I do for you? Uh, I blind. Oh, really? They're short, stocky, very intense. Black hair, extremely pale, anemic complexion. Probably didn't give you his name. He just left. His name is Philip Clark. Now, we physicians often find ourselves in a difficult ethical dilemma, Mr. Abbott. When do we violate our oath and discuss patients with the public? Now, presume a patient is a railroad engineer or an aeroplane pilot. Presume he's anxious, guilt-ridden, his behavior most unpredictable. Does the doctor violate the medical code and report this? Now, I think he's obliged to. Now, I am forced to tell you about Clark. He is what we term a uh, paranoic. He has systematized illusions. He's seeing things, you mean? Precisely. Uh, did he give you the story about the dead body? He did. Now, there actually is a woman named Eloisa Fernandez buried some miles from here. Now, she has no connection with Clark. I imagine he heard the name somewhere or read it in a newspaper. He imagines that she calls him and begs him to free her from the grave. Uh, characteristic morbid obsession. Now, I'm afraid we shall have to hospitalize him permanently. Well, is there anything I can do, Doctor? Uh, no, 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 thank you. I'm sorry if he gave you a rather gruesome time. Just thought I'd acquaint you with the facts. Did he offer you money? Yes, 10000 in cash. It was genuine, Mr. Abbott. He's extremely wealthy. Oh, there's no necessity for calling the police. It would just embarrass everyone. But this won't happen again, I assure you. It would have allowed him a shade too much freedom. Well, has he any family or friends? No, no. He's led a very, very secluded life. In a curious house he owns on Palmer Road below Carmel. I see. Well, thank you for coming, Doctor. Yes, I... I've violated my professional confidence, but I feel for well-justified reasons. Now, I'm sure you won't discuss this with anyone. Good afternoon. Goodbye, Doctor. You can come in now, dear. So, our body-snatching friend is named Philip Clark. Yeah. I know you, Mr. Abbott. That expression on your face. You're fitting pieces of a puzzle together. Is there a good double feature in the neighborhood? A whopper. Fine. I'll buy you a big jelly apple and a bag of popcorn. You can go to the movies tonight and live it up. Oh, while you go sticking your nose into this case. I'm just going to wander around, that's all. Say, for instance, to um, Clark's house on Palmer Road? Say, for instance, something like that. What time do we leave? Me, not you. Pat, if you don't take me with you, I'll go alone. I'll sneak out of the movies and follow you. Besides, who goes to romantic movies and sits in the dark alone? How square can you get? Oh, I was afraid of this. Come on, dear. Let's pay a visit to Mr. Clark. You sure you want to go? He might not be lonesome anymore. Well, what do you mean? Well, maybe he dug up company for himself.
That night, we drove to Palmer Road. It was across the Bay Bridge and down 101 to a section of Spanish villas clustered on a cliff by the Pacific. You had to swerve sharply off the highway and, and climb small, winding roads up the cliff. Occasionally, you'd see a, a hitchhiker, a Spanish farm worker. The weather, the weather was awful. The desolation was worse. Pat parked the car in the driveway on Palmer Road. It was a strange house that had evidently been redecorated, but the attempt to brighten it up was half-hearted and sort of neurotic. We stood on the porch and rang the bell. Nobody's home. Ring again. You want to try the door? I will. It's open. Wait. I want that dress. Yes, I think. Oh, where it is? Oh, Pat. Sounds, sounds like a big row upstairs. Let's sneak in. Easy. Careful now. Close the door. Now we... What is Mr. Clark at the top of the stairs? Hello, Mr. Clark. How are you? Abbott, I... Abbott! Pat! Pat, there's a knife in his back. Yes, and the man who put it there is behind him in the shadows, see? Stay where you are. Stop it, Pat. He's running. I'll get him. I'm going up the stairs. Look out, Pat! Get over here, Gene. The body will hit you. Ah! Philip Clark, with a knife in his back, fell down the stairway of his home. His body landed less than a foot from where I stood with Pat. The few seconds Pat lost while he grabbed me and sidestepped the body cost us the killer. By the time Pat had raced upstairs and the killer had reached the roof, crossed over to another house, then he disappeared. Pat, exhausted by the chase, came back to where I stood by Clark's body. Well, I got a good look at the murderer, Gene. I'll know him if I see him again. It's an ugly little runt. Darling, what have you got in your hand? Huh? Oh, it's a dress. A knife-throwing friend dropped it. He didn't dare stop and pick it up. I think that's why he came to visit the late Mr. Clark. Just to get a dress? Well, maybe. Well, let's see it, dear. Hold it up. Oh, Pat, it's fascinating. Look at the embroidery on it. Well, have you ever seen such work? Look at how they've woven all these complicated designs. Sort of Spanish looking, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. Well, come on. We'll call the police, then we're going home and play games on this dress. Play games on it? What kind of game? Tic-tac-toe. Oh, Pat, a man kills another man to get hold of a dress, and then you'd take it home and play tic-tac-toe on it. You know, confidentially, Bub, maybe you ought to see that psychiatrist too, hmm? When we got home, Pat gave me a pencil and paper took some himself, and then laid out the dress. Now, Gene, men don't kill each other over a dress, unless it's more than just a dress. As I know, I figured it out. You think the designs on it mean something. It's possible. So you take your pencil and paper and trace the pattern of the green thread. I'll do the same thing with the blue ones. Hmm. It's like being back in kindergarten again. Okay, teacher, let's trace the pretty colors. Looks like the green threads don't mean a thing, Pat. Well, the blues don't make sense either. All right, now you try the purple ones. I'll take the ivory threads. Mm, the purple threads don't make any pattern either. Comes out kind of silly. Uh-huh. And look at what I've got tracing the ivory thread. Why, it's an arrow. And and all those squares. But well, I'd say it looks like the plan of a building. You see, Pat, there, there'd be the windows. Two stories. And the arrow's pointing to a sort of tower on top. Don't you think so? Sure, that's it. But what building? Where? Well, we may find out soon. We'll be having a visitor. And... Oh, who's coming? The killer knows I picked up the dress... He knows my name. Clark said it just before he died. So, I'll send you back. 
Yes, we'll be having a visit soon from an ugly little rat who likes to dig knives into people. Pat was wrong. Nothing happened that night. Nothing happened the next morning. So Pat left the house and headed for his office, and I went downstairs with him. Now, just you stay home like a good girl. I'll handle whatever comes up. All right. You can handle it all by yourself. I have to go to the grocer's anyway. You mean you're actually going to stay out of this? Mm Mm-hmm. For a while. I'm going shopping. I don't get it. I have to go shopping, that's all. That's why you're wearing that awful blouse and skirt, I suppose. Thought you were going to throw them away. Well, my nice dresses get soiled when I handle bundles, dear, so I say this. Okay, goodbye. Pat. What? Don't let anything happen to you. Oh, why not? little gunplay might be fun. No. No, don't. I, I kind of like you, and who knows? This might blossom into a beautiful romance. Hello. Pat, I I finished shopping. Did the um, ugly little runt show up at your office? No, no signs here of anyone. Well, I sent the food, Pat. I'm not going home. I'm going to the Papagaya room for lunch. I met Laura. Do you remember her? The Papagaya room? Are you trying to drive me into bankruptcy, ma'am? Oh, but darling, lunch there is sensational. Oh, well. Pat. Yeah? I love you anyway. Mm. Even if you are a nasty old miser. Yeah. Goodbye, Mrs. Abbott. Goodbye, Scrooge. Pat had a very quiet day and went home at six. When he got there, I wasn't in. He just stretched that long, lanky body of his out on the couch when the doorbell rang. Uh, good evening, Mr. Abbott. Oh, Dr. Hayes. Mind if I sit down? No. Yeah. I read in the morning papers that my friend, Mr. Clark, was done away with. Did you? It wasn't used to me, of course. I'd arranged it. Uh-huh. What's your real name, pal? Oh, it's Hayes. Frederick Hayes. Of course, I'm not a psychiatrist. You have a charming apartment. Thank you. Uh... Waiting for your wife, Mr. Abbott? What's that got to do with it? Well, I think your wife will be late, sir. Very late. What are you driving at? I've been obliged to detain her. You what? No, 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 no. Try to keep calm, sir. She's with a friend of mine. He has instructions that if anything goes amiss, he's to kill your wife. Well, you rotten punk. Oh, it's very unfortunate, very. But I had no alternative. You have a dress here, Mr. Abbott. I want it. I knew you'd be reluctant to part with it, so I took the trouble of detaining your wife just after she left the Papagaya room. I thought this might persuade you to give me the dress. It might. I I want it right now. You have an alluring wife, sir. I'd be very reluctant to see my associate use a knife on her. I'll get the dress for you. Excellent. It's an intriguing dress, you know. Dates back to the days when California was dominated by the Spanish. Uh, they demanded very heavy taxes from the population. At a mission in San Linda, just south of here, uh, the fathers refused to comply. They took all of their treasure, in fact, all of the gold and valuable pieces in the town, and hid them in their mission. The Spanish, of course, were furious and ransacked the town. But they never found the treasure. A woman escaped from San Linda and made this dress with a map designed with the ivory threads telling exactly where the treasure could be found in the mission building. Precisely. Mm -hmm. And quite a treasure it is, reportedly worth $250,000. There's a picturesque legend now. They say the bell in the mission will ring when the treasure is found. I intend to ring it, Mr. Haddock. Yes, so I gathered. I think I can fill in the rest of the story. A woman named Eloisa Fernandez was buried in that dress very recently. Word got to Philip Clark and to you. You're both. Shall we say collectors of rare objets d'art? Clark asked me to help dig up the body so he could get the dress. You knew what he was up to. So you posed as his psychiatrist so I'd keep my hands off. 
Hank Clark got desperate that day and dug up the dress himself. He went home and... And a very ugly little associate of yours caught up with him. Mm, yes. Very careless he was, too. Dropping the dress. May I have it, please? It's in this closet. What? Well, it, it was here last night. Uh... I don't enjoy this kind of game, Mr. Abbott. Find that dress. It was in this closet. I don't know where it could be. I'm not impressed, Mr. Abbott. I don't believe you. But I'm going to be very generous. I shall give you... A few hours to locate the dress. I shall return here at, say, uh, midnight. If you don't give it to me then, well, my associate is so eager to use that knife on Mrs. Abbott, I won't be able to restrain him. I'll expect you at midnight. Good evening, Mr. Abbott. Always so pleasant to chat with you, sir. Mr. Hayes Hoodlum grabbed me. He blindfolded me. We drove quite a while. When they removed the blindfold, I was in a room that looked like those cells that friars used centuries ago. Religious pictures on the wall, bare table, prayer books, candlelight. An ugly little man who I guessed was the character who killed Clark sat in the room with me, watching me closely. He had an extra large pocket knife and he kept whittling on a small piece of wood. Couldn't you tell me why you brought me here? What's this all about? I don't know nothing. But, but you must... Shut have... up. Ah, Mrs. Abbott. Dr. Hayes. I'm sorry. I'm not really a physician. I'm just someone who's interested in finding that dress your husband has. Oh, I see. He was to give it to me tonight at 12 o'clock in your apartment. But I was just there. Your husband wasn't in. I'd warned him, too. Warned him? Yes, I told him if he didn't have the dress by midnight, we'd be obliged to kill you. That's why my friend has that knife. Oh. He's going to use it on you now. Oh, no. No. Oh. I shall step outside. The sight would be too offensive for me. Oh. I'll be back in a few minutes. Yeah, go ahead, Hayes. Leave it to me. Uh, sorry it worked out this way, Mrs. Abbott. Very unfortunate. Very. Come here, Mrs. Abbott. No. No, no. I got a nice, sharp edge on this knife. I said, come here, Mrs. Abbott. Oh, uh, oh, my you, arm. You, you, you break my arm. Drop that knife. Oh, Dad. What that? I said drop the knife. Why, I you... Go over. Oh, my shoulder. He's out cold. Come on, Jean. Get out of here quietly. Oh, Dad. I'll close this door. I'll drop the bolt. Now, where is Hayes? He was here a moment ago. I don't know where he is now. Oh, where are we, Pat? Did you bring the police? What? You had a mission in San Linda. I couldn't bring the police here. It's too risky. Hayes might have killed you. The building looked deserted, but I'm sure he's around here somewhere. Oh, this is the building designed on the dress. That's right. And there's a quarter of a million dollars in treasure here. Hayes is probably looking for it right now. No, shh. Come this way. Wait a minute. The arrow. He pointed to a tower. <sighs> sure. The bell tower. Maybe Hayes is poking around closer to the treasure than he thinks. I saw the bell tower on the way in. Through this archway. Come on now. Easy. There he is, Pat. Up in the bell tower. Stand aside where he can't see you. Come on down, Hayes. Mr. Abbott? Come down or I'll shoot you down. Oh, you aren't the only one who has a gun, Mr. Abbott. Pat, are you all right? Didn't get anywhere near me. It's too dark. You can't see me very well down here. But I can see him. The moonlight up there helps. All right, now you'll come down the hard way, Hayes. Ah! I got him. He's staggering, see? He's, uh, he's reaching for the bell rope to keep his balance. Won't work. He's falling right down the rope. Hayes wounded. 
fell to the bottom of the bell tower, clutching at the rope all the way. And, as the legend had predicted, the mission bell at San Linda rang out, for the treasure was in the bell tower. Pat and I found it in the tower under the bricks surrounding the bell, just where the arrow and the dress had pointed. We turned it over to the church. It was sunrise by the time we were back in the lobby of our house. Pat, how did you know I was in San Linda? Well, the map on the dress showed a building, dear. When Hayes came to see me, he was so sure of himself, he spilled the whole story. He mentioned the mission at San Linda. I figured he'd take you there, where he could keep an eye on you and the building at the same time. Now, uh, you have some explaining to do to me here. Me? Okay, if you want to stall. Take off your dress. Pat Abbott. Here, in the lobby. You heard me. Take off that dress right now. Well, really, suggesting that your own wife do a strip tease in the lobby. Do you take it off yourself or do I rip it off? (laughs) All right, dear, I give up. You've got another dress on underneath this outfit, haven't you? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, how'd you know? Well, when I found out the Spanish gown was missing from my guest closet, I knew you'd put it on. And put a loose-fitting outfit on over it. Oh, wasn't it clever of me? I knew all sorts of people would be gunning for the dress, so I figured the best place to hide it was just to put it on. But how'd you know that I was wearing it? Well, when we went out this morning, you had on this horrible blouse and skirt. Then you phoned and said you were going to the Papagaya room for lunch. You also said you hadn't been home. Now, Jean, dear, you'd never go to that swanky place in a terrible outfit like this without an extra special reason. Wasn't it a good idea, Pat? Oh, yes, very. Nearly got you killed. <clears throat> See, are you wearing that goo goo again? Prince Michael's essence of whatnot? Pat, it's the finest perfume there is. Forty dollars a half ounce. And eighty dollars an ounce. You trying to drive me into bankruptcy? And doesn't it make you want to kiss me? No. I'm always a pushover for that little idea. <laughs> Oh, don't you like my perfume just a little bit, Pat? It's okay. I mean, when you kiss me and inhale it, don't you really go for it? Oh, I suppose so. Yes. I'm so glad. Why, because it makes me romantic? No. Because I bought three more bottles today. Moral of the story. Up until now, science thought it could create the biggest explosion in history by setting off an atomic bomb. But it's now possible to create an even bigger reaction. Just tell your husband you bought $120 worth of perfume. The National Broadcasting Company has presented The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as those popular personalities of detective fiction, Pat and Jean Abbott, created by Francis Crane. Tonight's cast included Joe DeSantis and John Ridgely. The Adventures of the Abbots was written by Howard Merrill. Original music composed and conducted by Dewey Bergman. Produced by Ted Lloyd and Bernard L. Schubert. Directed and recorded by Harry Frazee. Now, this is Wayne Howell inviting you to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting adventure in crime with Pat and Jean in The Adventure of the Abbots. Welcome back. Uh, one thing I have to note my observation here is that, uh, is that uh, Jean's a- Abbott's life is most endangered. Not when she goes on cases with Pat, but when Pat tells her to stay away for her own safety or so that she won't get in a way. Or in his way, excuse me. It may be better for all concerned, particularly for Jean, for him just to let her come along. Well, we uh, now turn to listener feedback. I got an email from um, Doug Gordon. said, I've been a listener for about six months and I'm loving the podcast. I'm a licensed private investigator. And I love the old uh, detective radio shows. Your podcast has given me the courage to start my own podcast. 
Real Detectives about modern real-life detective work. Uh, his website for his uh, investigation, it's uh, secure-investigative.com. If you have iTunes, you just do a search for Real Detective, um, and uh, um, podcasts are posted monthly. So uh, thanks so much, and best of luck to you in getting that started, Doug. I uh, got a com uh got a uh, donation from uh uh Chris who's given uh before just donated to you. I hope you can use it to keep your show going. Thank you for doing what you do. It is much appreciated. And also got a donation from uh, LaDonna who says thanks for keeping me sane during the workday and I will go ahead and send uh, LaDonna access to our premium site which we do for all donations of $7 or more. And Chris of course is already actually a a premium member. Well, that will do it for uh, uh, today's episode. We'll be back tomorrow with Nero Wolf. In the meantime, if you have a comment, uh, please feel free to email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives, and follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.